Hey, now, so I wanted to reach out to the 49ers because I felt that, you know, we were in the Bay Area, and they had a young ticket sales guy who that, felt that he should, you know, be up here, Al Guido. Guido. And then, uh, you know, also he said, well, I'll bring this other young data guy in. And they're both young, they're kind of new, so yeah. I don't really know, you know, how much they really know about, you know, Levi Stadium or anything else, but Paul Epstein as well. And so they're going to do it together, kind of, you know, without being too much of a crooner act, but uh, here you guys are. So That's thanks. Right. Thank you very much. Do we have a, so who has the, what's up everybody? Good morning. <laughs> See a lot of familiar faces in the room. Yeah. Oh, great. Amy stole the <laughs> So I couldn't agree with Amy's last statement anymore. They are the most important people in the room for the most part from a fan service perspective. So quick background. Man, a lot of familiar faces. What's up, Paul? Um, <laughs> quick background. So I'm uh, currently I serve as a chief operating officer for the San Francisco 49ers. So my purview is everything on the 49ers from a business perspective. Um, off, outside of the field. I was once a D3 college football player, so I like to think I can throw and catch passes, but I don't do that anymore. My background in professional sports uh, was born in the sales and marketing world. I started as an inside sales rep for the Philadelphia 76ers, actually really for Comcast Spectacore selling Philadelphia Wings tickets, which nobody in here probably has ever heard of the Philadelphia Wings. They were an indoor lacrosse team. That was the first ticket I've ever sold in all of professional sports. Ganella knows who they are. <laughs> So um, really what we want to talk about, Troy asked us to talk a little bit about CRM and analytics and sort of how it's changing the game relative to sales. And there's a slide at the end that I think most people will probably think, you know, people who know me will say, man, that's crazy that you're now saying that compared to what you used to say probably 10 years ago relative to how the sales and marketing world works. Paul is going to run you through kind of where we sit today around all of the products that we sell how a rep has a hard time managing all of those things, why CRM and analytics makes sense now because of all the different properties that you have to sell, right? All of your different work uh, forces are getting even more creative, right? So the days of season tickets, while some may say they're dead, I would argue, although I work in the NFL, so maybe they're a little bit more alive in the NFL than maybe they are in other fields. But the truth of the matter is that it is changing, right? Season ticket sales, in some cases, may be going up or down. So you're having to be a lot more creative with all of your packaging, you know, whether that's mini plans, partial plans, holiday plans, how you sell a season ticket from a membership perspective. So I think more important now is how you manage your time, how you prospect, who you're prospecting, right? Because the day and age when I grew up in the industry of you know, calling out of an Excel spreadsheet, which when I first started, is over. Those days are dead. And if they're not, you know, look, don't listen to me per se, but <laughs> if they're not, please make sure they get dead as quickly as possible. So I'm going to turn it over to Paul, and he's going to run you through. Um, by the way, Paul's our director of sales, so he manages everything 49ers revenue base. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, Al. And just by show of hands, who was at last month's SBJ conference? Okay, good. So new material, hopefully. There was a... <laughs> There was a panel, bringing this up for a reason, there was a panel on data. And the moderator posed the questions, what are the first question or first thoughts that come to mind when you hear the words data or analytics, which are huge buzzwords in today's day and age? And things such as effectiveness, efficiency, intelligence, and robust were all things that they said. And he took a step back and noted, nobody said revenue. Nobody said increasing sales. So for us, we have the fortune of having infrastructure to be touted as one of the most technologically advanced buildings in the world. Al's going to touch a lot on what those details look like. But from our perspective, if we can't monetize it, if we're not better understanding our fans day in and day out, then where is it headed? What is the pot of gold at the end look like? And so we're always going to put a revenue cap on when looking at all things data and analytics. So looking at our revenue pie, Al mentioned we do have a few revenue streams, many of which are common throughout the industry. So think corporate partnerships, all things premium, stadium builders licenses, which are essentially our PSLs, our season tickets, if you will. 
And for non-49ers events, suites and groups. Now, what's unique is we did have the opportunity to be more innovative and create a number of separate monetized assets in which we have a fine dining restaurant on site. We take a look at that from both a game day and a non-game day perspective. We developed a tours program where over 200,000 paid guests entered our gates in year one, invested a significant amount of money into a state-of-the-art museum, and that gets activated both non-game day and game day as well. And last but not least, our special events business. So think anything that ranges from a five to seven figure spend on a single day for anything from a trade show to a conference to a wedding to a corporate reception and all things like. So when you have such a diverse wheel of revenue, the main position and the challenge, frankly, that that puts you in is how do you all communicate with one another? Right? It used to be, and both Al and I got started in the old school inside sales days where it was fulls, it was partials, even groups at the time were barely starting to come up. Premium was not nearly as mature as it is today. So at most you had four revenue streams to speak for. Now you look at this wheel and you ask yourself, so what is the common thread? How do you communicate? What is the language that you speak? And for us, CRM is the back end to all things data and analytics so that we can have synergy, we can have this cohesive unit, and we have full transparency. So Justin talked about transparency from a staffing standpoint. I think it's equally as critical from a process standpoint so that we all have a long-term view of our customers day in and day out. And, and really where this leaves us, data is not an overnight thing. If tomorrow we, we all come to ALSD to have that one big takeaway or a series of takeaways that as soon as we get back in our home markets, whether it's this Friday or next week, what can we put into play day one? And trust me, there's going to be so many things that can have that immediate impact. From a data perspective, this is a marathon, not a sprint. And so what I mean by that is we almost separated out, similar to building a home, which is something that Al's, Al's familiar with going through as we speak, right? So you build a facility and you have all these learnings where year one, there were two main organizational objectives. It was education and awareness. So think a couple miles down the road from here, Candlestick Park, you're a season ticket holder. You're going through the process potentially of do I get in the seat license world at Levi Stadium. There is an education that comes along with that. You think tours, museums, special events, Michael Mina's restaurant on site. What does that truly mean for me as a consumer? Is it a fit? What are you trying to sell me? And is there value? And for all of those different questions and, and debates that we had internally, there was both the education and awareness. And now you fast forward to year two. In year two, you say, what did I learn in year one? Should I take a step back and take a look at our products, our pricing, our packaging? Is this more sales muscle that's needed for X revenue stream? Or can we drive a lot more of this revenue activity through our marketing channels? Right? And, and Al and I will debate at the very end about where you truly need to exercise more of that human organic element versus there's a lot of things that you can leverage technology for. So needless to say, year one and two, there was that evolution from education and awareness to applying all of the potential cross-pollination of these revenue streams that you see in front of you. And now year three, it's about developing something that is sustainable for the long haul from a data perspective. So Al will dive here into Fan360. Yeah, so just a quick background on the, how the 49ers, um, so we use Core as our partner um, relative to CRM. Um, we use Tableau as our partner relative to like backend data and analytics. Um, I will tell you that um, my team, and I'm not saying this is the right for everyone, but there is a debate in the world now around, do you have 25 salespeople and two data analytics people? I have six business intelligence people on my staff. Seems like a lot, right? But I value it um, as much as probably anything else, right? Because I think the day and age, and everyone knows the statistics, you can tout any source, whether it be Forbes will tell you that 80% of Americans wake up and the first thing they do is they grab their phone, 
They don't brush their teeth. They don't go to the bathroom. They grab their phone and they read it. Right? The time frames in which you have the ability to connect with people, the windows are getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And what does that generally mean is that your time frame in the sales and marketing world continues to get shorter and shorter and shorter. We'll debate later on the old school versus new school and cold calls. I can't tell you the last cold call I ever answered. I can't tell you who it was, why they called, what they were pitching. I cannot tell you. Right? So I want to know everything about my prospective client or my fan right, before they know that I know it. So how do we do that? Right? We spend a lot of money on our mobile application. We can go a lot of debates on paperless and mobile ticketing and what that truly means. Right? We are going everything mobile in our building, in our tickets, in our parking, in our content. So we developed our own application internally, right? which a lot of reasons to do that was to tie all of our POS systems together. So that Ticketmaster spoke to Micros, right? Because in CRM, you can download any lead listing. But sometimes you still had to go back into Artix or whatever ticketing system and know how many, people, how many games that person may or may not have attended. So we spent a lot of time and money and effort in tying all of these systems together because not only do I want to know how many games you've attended, I also want to know how much merchandise you've bought. Right? Because I want to be able to dictate whether you're an avid fan. And some teams do this really well around categorizing their season ticket packages where they ask people these questions in surveys. And that's great. We do that too. Right? We both do the qualitative and quantitative. But what if I already knew it? What if I already knew whether you were an avid fan? I never have to ask you because I had all the data and all analytics. So we spent a lot of time, like I said, a lot of money and a lot of time personnel on providing. The roadmap is certainly to provide our sales staff with as much information as you can possibly get before anyone decides to pick up a phone, send an email, send a Twitter message, send a LinkedIn, whatever it is you use to get in contact with people. We want to make sure that the sales team has every single piece of information about a prospective buyer or a prospective client. So this is the way that we view the world, and then we'll tie all those back together. And now real quick to yeah. taking a step back to Fan360, I think the way that all of this data, because we can all admit those of us that have been in these buying closed doors conversations that sometimes can, we ask ourselves, can there be too much data, data overload, the whole paralysis by analysis in the sales game, and really what a lot of these data points do is we get a better understanding of who our fans are from an existing client perspective. Because as they say, fish where the fish are. So then from a new revenue generation standpoint, what you're looking at is who are my current buyers? And then you segment out in levels of engagement who your prospective buyers are. So that you have your, the base of the pyramid, they're already in. And then you keep on going up the ladder from highly engaged to middle patterns, to disengage, and the questions are, how do I continue in marketing? They call this lead nurturing. How do I continue to walk them along? It's not gonna be always an overt sales message touch point number one. Sometimes there have to be a series of communication points. So needless to say, that you know we've all heard that the best way to predict future behavior is by understanding past behavior. So how can we prospect strategically and effectively if we don't know who's in our building that is already in the family and now we continue to add those layers. So just wanted to add on that, while, while it looks like it could be information overload, every single campaign that we try to execute upon, there's always gonna be some core characteristics and they're very unique in nature because as you saw, there's so many different revenue streams that this isn't a one size fits all uh, issue that we have. Yeah. So to put uh, stats in mind, so just by um, Wi-Fi and mobile alone, so we used to know about 20,000 season ticket holders within our database. This all sounds very true to everybody in the room. You know who bought on Ticket Exchange. You wouldn't necessarily know who bought on StubHub, depending upon who your partners are here. For the NFL, it's, it's Ticketmaster. Um, we gained about 300,000 people within year one just by going to some type of mobile ticketing platform. It wasn't the only, you could still use hard tickets and you could still use PDFs. So this year, the second year of that is to use PDF and mobile only, no hard tickets whatsoever. So we'll see what the ratio does relative to mobile 
and PDF. This year, it was about 8% of people use their hard tickets. Okay, so you ask your questions, why do you still do it? If it's for marketing purposes, fine. If it's for brand purposes, fine. I would imagine if you actually did the deep dive on the data, most people are printing out PDFs or they're probably using their mobile device if you actually allow it. Right? So then the question becomes, well, how do you get more people on mobile? Because to do that gets you more data and the like. Right? I would tell you it also increases all the other things. Right? I would tell you that our food and beverage service being on mobile increased our per caps $2 above what a normal belly up stand would be. Right? So there's all these reasons, and I don't look at any one P&L sheet the same. Right? I don't say, well, if your mobile device is $200,000, you can't actually get the ROI on that $200,000. Well, you have no idea. You probably don't what that may or may not mean to have that type of data on someone. So we spent a lot of time, as I said, on effort and money on this. Yes? Uh, quick question. How does Venue Next tie into all of this and, and, and play into your overall <coughs> analysis of your, of your campaign? Yeah, so we, um, we, we incubated a company. Um, so we funded it. It's called Venue Next. It's in the marketplace right now. We have um, a few partners that we've brought online within the professional sports space. Um, so I would say we're the competitor um, to Yin's Cam, or we're the competitor in the Major League Baseball platform, probably to BAM, not necessarily the website per se, but certainly the mobile application in venue. Um, for us, I would say the biggest reasons to do it was um, some offense, but uh, a lot of defense per se. We use offense and defense because we're in sports. So offense-wise, we got more data, right? We felt like we can increase per caps. We felt like content was kind of headed that way, so that's why we did it. Defensively, we certainly felt like um, season tickets were get, being attacked because, because of the at-home experience, so the in-stadium experience needed to be upgraded. Uh, we also felt as though we were probably spending way too much money on printed tickets um, that we could affect efficiencies within our parking structure um, or how we ran those. So, we felt as though we needed to create an application because it was one thing to have a debate around um, mobile ticketing or delayed delivery or whatever you want to say. Um, we always felt as though we needed to create a platform that people would go to, not be forced to go to. Right. So if you were forced to use mobile ticketing and that was the only benefit of using whatever application that you had, you probably wouldn't do it all that much. But if I told you that it increased your parking or that it gave you content that you didn't otherwise get or or it allowed you to get into a, uh, or allowed you to get food and beverage delivered to your seat quicker, right? You would probably more, you'd more likely use that for your mobile platform than you wouldn't, per se. So, um, our our thought process right now is that's sort of the front end mobile piece, and then we use all of the business intelligence on the back end to scrub all that data to put it to be actionable to all the department heads so that they can make effective business decisions. Um, and that could be anything. That could be operations, right? What time do you open gates? How many workers do you need on staff? How much parking do you actually truly need versus how much you have? Um, all of those things kind of lead into it. I don't know if that answered your question, but um, I won't spend a lot of time on this because I want to ask, I want to get some questions. So by far away, we are not there. Um, I appreciate Troy's intro, but we are not, we're, we're nowhere even near where we truly want to be. I think we're Getting close, I think we're in a position where we have CRM people and business intelligence people that can tell our sales staff where leads come from, what demographics are buying, um, what the effect of sales process may or may not be, meaning how many touch points you may or may not need into a client before they actually make a buying decision. Um, but the main goal is the very top one, right, which is personalization. We spent a lot of time as Venue Next and the 49ers, one of our clients is Orlando Magic. If there's anybody in the magic here, I think they just do a fantastic job on predictive analytics. Um, you know, what it may mean if a single game buyer comes into your building that you're able to actually send them a message the minute that they're walking out of the building for a discounted offer or an ability to buy a mini pack right on the spot, right? And that's where this thing is going, right? You talk, you hear a lot about beacons and the like and, and why you use them. And, in truth, right, you don't use them for GPS, although we do, we'll say we do, but who's looking down at their phone telling them where they go in an arena, right? You use it because it gives you the ability to be able to speak to people in a proactive nature, right? You use it because it will give you the ability to say, for instance, we talk a lot about the operational road around food spoilage, not sexy, but food spoilage. How many hot dogs do you actually throw away in the fourth quarter? Well. 
How crazy as it would be is sort of dynamic food pricing, right? If I just told you that I could send a note to every single person that's on the mobile application to buy a $2 hot dog in the fourth quarter. Those days are coming, right? Those days are coming where you literally can walk inside of a building and you probably don't even need to go up to a mobile device. Your Bluetooth and whatever will just announce that you're there. And that, you know, while that is more holistic, three, you know, 30,000 foot vision, that is where we're headed relative to data and analytics. I'll let Paul finish, finish off and then we'll sure. question. And on the personalization piece too, a couple of real examples, and I'm glad Al said we're not there, but in a sense, we know what we're striving to gather from all of this, these data warehouses. And so needless to say, exclusive content, should we be sending all 49ers content to all fans? Or if we know Colin Kaepernick is your favorite player, should we have non-publicized content that goes directly to those consumers that we know would appreciate it? If you gain trends and analytics behind F&B and merch, which Al covered, I think there's a lot there. And then from my perspective on the new business side, we have uh, one of our big challenges here. One was educating our 49ers base that there were other events at Levi Stadium, right? There were concerts, there was college football, wrestling, outdoor hockey, and, and the like. So, what that meant to us is can we become more targeted and strategic with our communication, or should we inform everybody of everything? And so, needless to say, the, the end all be all goal is to become more targeted and customized and personalized. So, the, the unique part about CRM, and, and we've recently gone through a migration internally where, um, as, as Al said, we're still, we're still uh, treading water here from the standpoint of we're getting our processes in a row. We're trying to facilitate a data point where, and a lot of our sales crew is here today, the end all be all goal is for us to have this manifested scoring system that is defined as purchasing power and that a lot is going to derive from our existing client base that we will layer over our perspective but the goal is to become much more dynamic so when we talk here about crm landscape in reaching out to industry peers activity management contact management pipeline management 80 90 percent we were all doing the same things so the 2.0 version of crm and putting ourselves in our own shoes here this is about okay we know that based on digital engagement or any other characteristic that we're evaluating we want to strike while the iron is hot per se we want to capitalize when your emotions are highest and so can we create touch point campaigns whether on the sales or service side that we will almost have real-time indicators that always trigger something where a call an email and direct marketing efforts all hit within a multi-day or a single week window. That is the 2.0 version of where we envision CRM being right now. Just like a lot of others, we are going through the blocking and tackling exercises, becoming smarter by the day, and allowing our analytics team to go through their multi-year process to put us in a position to become more dynamic with what we do. So as you can see here, sales service as a whole, I think the industry is improving. Now it's about merging the worlds of data and analytics with this warehouse known as CRM so that it can truly get layered above. And in closing, healthy debate to have in the time that we do have remaining. So Al and I, as, as recently as last week, we're talking old school versus new school. And Al joked that I'm sure everybody, especially that knows him uh, from, from all his days and, and myself about a decade into the business, I would have never thought that we would steer any direction other than old school because we both cut our teeth through inside sales. We both understood that the way of looking at this was a dial gives you a more probable contact, gives you a more probable lead, hopefully you're meeting with somebody, hopefully you're closing somebody, and so on and so forth. And now we're hearing things about her questions, our cold calls dying. And Al himself says he can't remember the last time a cold call got through, um, which is great information for all of us to know. So obviously I followed up with the question of, well then how do we get a hold of you? And I'd love to hear his perspective on that. But you hear about items such as social selling, which I know there's folks here from LinkedIn and there's teams that, that we have from our networks that are very integrated into using LinkedIn and other social media platforms as a way of selling. So five years from now, do we look back at that 
Is it a fad or a phenomenon? And I think time will tell. We naturally feel bullish on certain characteristics, but you keep hearing statistics such as 60%, this is more on the B2B side, 60% of a buyer's due diligence happens before we make our first contact. So from that perspective, does that sound old school? Does that sound like a dial to a contact, to a lead, to an appointment, to a close is going to get you to the promised land? And so again, all healthy debate, we don't have all the answers. We just encourage ourselves constantly behind closed doors to always try to be on the more progressive side of analyzing a situation. And ultimately, this is a bottom line business. We recommend to do what works. Not every market is created equal. Not every venue is created equal. The way your sales and service staffs are structured could change the ball game in terms of your approach. So uh, again, all healthy food for thought. Love to open it up for any questions that the group may have unless. Yeah. Go ahead. Have you thought about taking a look back at it in terms of rep efficiency, too? Huh. So Yep. This rep is more efficient by their talk time, so we're not as focused on the amount of calls they make per day. We know that this person's going to be um, on the phone and they're going to be creating that. Because I know a lot of times we look at the analytics of just calls or just talk. Sure. We look at them very siloed, yet we don't look at them as predictive factors of what's going to make them. I don't want to answer. I'll answer. <laughs> okay, go ahead. I can tell you, I mean, granted, I don't manage the day to day staff of the sales team, but. I haven't looked at a call log or asked somebody what a talk time is in years. I, I just don't, I guess I don't care. Um, I, ultimately, right, the job is to sell something. So I, I feel as though if you're selling things, um, you're probably going about it the right way. Now, granted, activity levels matter. They absolutely do. I would never say they don't. Um, I guess it's not the only trigger of information anymore, right? And um, you know, I used to be the person that would say this amount of calls and this amount of talk time and that's really what you should be doing. And, and then it became, well, no, it's not really about the calls. It's more about the, how many meetings you set. And in truth, all, like I said, all of those things kind of circle up into how truly effective are you at your job, yeah. right? And, um, you know, I, I mean, to the point where I actually made the comment to Paul, I'm sure this will get tweeted out or whatever, but I, I actually made the comment that cold calls are dead. Um, I, I just, dead in the sense that um, the phone is still a very valuable tool, extremely valuable tool, but in the sense that the day that y you ask all these qualifying questions to someone, they, they're not, they're, they're not going to answer those questions for very long periods of time. They may ask, ask or answer one or two, right? But, it's dead in the sense of, hey, let do do, you know, take this sheet, take this listing, call this person, go from there, ask all these qualifying questions at the end, try to sell them something. Like that's, I'm sorry, like that day doesn't exist anymore. And if it does, I guess I don't live in it. But um, my take is, you gotta know about your buyer. I think Amy said it best. You, you gotta actually know who else bought, right? Whether it's a competitor or a friend or whatever. I mean, I look at how I got on Troy's podcast. It was because he had gotten one of the people I grew up in this industry on his podcast, reached out and said, hey, I got X on my podcast, right? I mean, that was his version of the cold call, which immediately gave my attention because I was like, well, yeah, of course I know that person. I don't know Troy per se, but I know that person, right? So I think all of those things <laughs> are reasons that you have to have the data analytics be you know, <laughs> before you actually make the outbound call. Because like any other thing in your life, Preparation is like one of the most important things ever, right? So if you don't do it, I have no idea how you call someone, don't know who they are, think you can ask them questions, and then think you can actually sell them something worth thousands of dollars at the end of it. When is the last time any of you bought something worth thousands of dollars within your first interaction with someone before you even knew them? That's why I'm not saying it's dead per se, it's just dead in the sense of the way I used to look at it. Hey. Yes, good. What we've done in Orlando is we've changed the way that we score people. And basically what we do is we've set up stages of the sales cycle. And in CRM, it's all about how quickly you move those people and how long they stay in your sales cycle. So it's completely changed the way that our reps kind of look at you know, what is activity and what works. Yeah, and I would also add to echo both statements to what another item that Al and I debated last week is if we think that we are sales managers exclusively, then we're, miss, we're missing the boat. 
So what we meant by that is one day I may have to put my marketing cap on. It may not be in my title, but that is the approach. I need to analyze consumer psychology because if I stay in that rut of a dial to a contact to a lead, I may have blind spots. That the real world intercepts our utopian scenarios every single day. So we'll take some questions. I know sure. sorry, we're quick. Yeah. In my mind, certainly. I think, um, you know, I don't know how you do your meetings, funnels, but in my mind, certainly, I think the engage, how many active people they have, similar to a, how Facebook or Twitter probably view their database, is like, what's their database versus what's the active database? It's kind of like how many calls versus the actual amount of people that are maybe going to buy your product. That's kind of how I view it. You've got a handle on, certainly, it's the Silicon Valley. Do you have any kind of a feel for how this thing plays in like Pascagoula, Mississippi or somewhere else that's not as tech savvy? That's a great question. Um, so the way I think I view it is as long as, you know, a lot of the reasons why you do these things is to actually aid the fan experience, then in most cases, at least I've found, no matter where, because we're out selling Van Next in a lot of different um, platforms. So, as long as it, you go in it with the expectation that you're enhancing the fan experience and that you're actually creating benefits for them that they otherwise don't get today, I think people are okay with you knowing that much amount of data, right? I think I often say, if I told you you could get to the building in 20 minutes, you know, you could get here 20 minutes um, before you normally get here, if I just told you this, this, and this, they would say, no problem, right? Um, if I told you to enter this gate on your phone because this line was massively backed up, you'd say no problem. Like any one of you flew here, if you wait in a long security line, if you got a, a proactive message to go to X amount of gate and it was a two minute walk, but you would have gotten right through, you would have taken it. So I, I think it's all in the delivery of how you tell people. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think exactly how you would probably think of it is, um, not to say traditional advertising is dead. I don't want to just say everything's dead today. Um, <laughs> but we don't really do any traditional advertising, no paper, no direct mail. Um, a lot of it is um, via social and the like. So I think, you know, as Paul mentioned, we're just trying to get smarter around the pray or spray and pray method of, you know, just go out to your entire database, but um, go to the people who are actually active within certain segments. And um, so we're trying to get smarter. We're using people that way. We're certainly not sending emails to our entire database anymore. We're making sure that it's season ticket based, prospect based, right? Someone who's touched our product versus someone who has not touched our product. Um, and Paul mentioned that, right? A lot of it is people that are already educated versus people who have no idea what you're doing. Um, we're doing that quite a bit, but there's no doubt that we've moved away from anything that's mass marketing. Um, we just feel like it hasn't had the return that we probably thought it did or should. Well, round of applause for these two. Thank you very much.